Well, we turn to God's Word this morning and uh, in a series that we've begun uh, as uh, living as disciples and carrying today one another's burdens but the one another's of Scripture. Let me just go back to uh, names uh, for a a while. I I didn't want to say this for the children that probably maybe wouldn't have uh, picked it up, but uh, a friend of mine working in the Royal Victoria uh, came across a situation where a girl was in having a baby. Uh, and uh, great excitement, and uh, the, the nurse brought the baby in for the first time uh, to the room in one of those little see-through cots that they have, uh, and one of her friends was in visiting her, and she said, what do you call the baby? And the girl said with great prize, Femali. Uh, and the visitor said, well, that, that's an unusual one. I haven't come across Femali before. And the girl said, no, the nurse wheeled the baby in, and it says Femali in the bottom of the cot. She says, I liked it, so just thought we'd call her Femali. F- female? Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. I thought it was funny, but there we are. Anyway, uh, what's in the name? But we're, we're doing something totally different uh, today about carrying one another's burdens. I hope I didn't tell you this one before. An old couple we're in McDonald's having a, a meal. And uh, diners couldn't help but notice that the couple just had one meal shared between them and two knives and forks. Uh, and they noticed that the, the old lady cut the, the meal in half and separated the, the two halves of the meal out. And people thought, oh, dear, dear love that old couple, you know, they're so sweet. Uh, uh, we, we need to do a wee whip around for the man that he can get a meal of his own. And so they had a wee whip around and they went up to the man and uh, they said, look, uh, uh, we know it may be hard on the pension, but here's the money for a meal of your own. And he said, no, 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 thank you very much. We, don't worry, my wife and I share everything uh, and I'm just waiting for her teeth. Uh, so uh, sharing everything Caring and bearing one another's burdens is our theme uh, for today. Now, we don't know the name of the homeowner in Capernaum. Uh, And uh, I love the fact that he opened his home to Jesus. And he invited Jesus in to preach and to teach and to heal the sick. And and you can understand how the home was just packed out to, to overflowing. And I love the fact that there were four men who were friendly with this paralyzed man who decided they would carry him to Jesus. Uh, And when they got to the door, they couldn't get in, so they go up on the the outside stairs to the flat roof, and they begin to dig through a hole uh, in the roof. Now, I I don't know, it's not recorded in Mark's gospel what the owner of the house thought. I'll tell you this much. We we bought a new-built house uh, two years ago in Newcastle, simply because we, we didn't want to have any repairs or anything happening. If somebody dug a hole in our roof and let a stretcher down through it, we would not be best pleased, no matter who was speaking. Uh, And yet, here's this man, and he's let down in the stretcher by their four friends. So, we we read in Mark uh, chapter 2 and uh, verses 3 and 4 these words. Uh, Some men came, bringing to Jesus a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. Now, this to me is a story that illustrates carrying one another's burdens, so I don't want to dwell too long or too much on what Jesus does in the healing of this man. But what I do want to point out is this. Jesus always deals with the main issues in our lives. Uh, And so, the interesting thing was, if you read Mark chapter 2 and verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. So here's this man lying on a stretcher, unable to move, and the first thing that Jesus says to him is, son, your sins are forgiven. You see, Jesus saw beyond the paralysis. He saw beyond the years of suffering and the years of frustration and the years of uh, torment, Uh, and he knew that the man needed a change of heart. Uh, And so he said, first of all, son, your sins are forgiven you. Uh, And then, knowing what the Pharisees and the the teachers of the law are muttering about uh, how this blasphemous man is forgiving sins, he turns in Mark chapter 2, 11 and 12 and says, I tell you, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up and take up your mat and go home. 
He got up and took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. You see, Jesus can deal with the main issues in our lives. And we sang earlier about God being the God to whom we bring our burdens, we cast our burdens on, and that's very important. But if the church cannot deal with the primary issues, you and I can never make anybody a Christian. You and I can never forgive anybody's sins. We can forgive them if they wrong us or hurt us, but we can't forgive their sins. Only God can do that. And only Jesus can deal with the main issues in life. But it's the church, I would say, who can deal with the secondary issues. The paralyzed man had no way of getting to Jesus, so he's four friends, and they put a hand each in the stretcher, and they carry him to Jesus. The church should be a group of stretcher bearers. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about the privilege of Christian fellowship, but we remain surprisingly superficial at practicing it. Sometimes we think of the help that we should give to others, but we can't miss the latest TV program to uh, go down the street and help someone out. Uh, and if Christian fellowship is to be real, if to be a disciple of Jesus means bearing and carrying each other's or one another's burdens, then we need to understand what Paul says in Galatians is this, by bearing one another's burdens, he said, we fulfill the law of Christ. What is that law of Christ that Paul referred to? I think it's how Jesus summed up the whole of the Old Testament. I love it. Jesus, you know, there's the economy of words uh, in things like the Lord's Prayer and in things like the Sermon on the Mount. There's an economy of words that are incredible. He summed up the whole of the Old Testament in love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind and your neighbor as yourself. In other words, he's saying that if you want to live as a disciple, of a follower of Jesus, then loving God on that vertical plane needs to be expressed on the horizontal plane in loving one another and carrying one another's burdens. So here were four friends caring for a man who was on a stretcher. His stretcher was one of physical illness, but as Jesus pointed out, also spiritual blindness. And here's the thing, there are multiple stretchers around today. It may be for some unemployment or a broken relationship. It may be illness or the effects of austerity. It may be a spiritual problem or an emotional problem. It may be suffering the effects of some form of abuse. It may be having been let down. Uh, by someone that you trusted. It may be suffering bereavement or other kinds of loss. Uh, you get the kind of picture. There are many stretchers that we might be on, and some of these things affect us. Anything that actually cripples us mentally, physically, or emotionally places us on a stretcher in need of the support and encouragement of others. I, I love the lyrics of Clifford T. Ward. I don't know if there's any Clifford T. Ward fans here. It reminds me of uh, um, an essay I had to do at university, uh, and uh, we were supposed to pick a poet, uh, and uh, I picked one that nobody had ever heard of, which meant I was able to say anything about him, and uh, nobody could mark me wrong. Uh, but Clifford T. Ward was an English school teacher uh, of English, uh, and uh, he took ill and died at a fairly young age. But uh, in a song called Not Waving, Drowning, he writes this, You get the wrong impression of me. You think I would not miss you if you did not come. It's obvious you don't see clearly, because if you did, you'd see how all at sea I am. And the chorus, I'm not waving, I'm drowning. Why don't you save me? Because you're the only one who can. I'm not waving. I'm drowning. Now, how many of us feel like that in church? How many of us feel like that in work? And the boss comes in and you look busy uh, and he hasn't a clue that you're submerged and you don't really know what's going on. How many of us feel in the midst of a crowd, I'm not waving, I'm drowning? If only people could see what's inside us sometimes, they'd be quite shocked. And maybe there are some of us here, maybe many of us, who are actually wanting to say to our friends, I'm not waving, I'm drowning. Why don't you save me? Because you're the only one who can. You're the only one who can take a hand to the stretcher and bring me to Jesus. You're the only one who can help me. 
And so I wonder why it is that in our churches, we often fail to have a fellowship that's very deep and meaningful. Uh, why it is that it's so often fairly superficial. Uh, in a wonderful book I read a good number of years ago now called Stretcher Bearers by Michael Slater, he suggests four reasons. I'll just give his headings and then go off on my own tangent on them. He says there are four reasons why uh, people don't cry out for help to their friends. The first one is this, a fear of honesty. What would happen what would people think of me, you might think, and I might think, if I express things like doubt, if I say things like, I cannot cope? I mean, don't we all wear masks? We come to church on Sunday, and I say we're sometimes guilty of the great Sunday lion. And by that, I don't mean those who are still in their pits when we're at church. I mean that we come to church, and we say and smile to people and say, how are you? Fine, thanks. Uh, and inwardly, Although we've outwardly said, I'm fine, thanks, we're not waving, we're drowning. Uh, what would it be like if we were just honest with each other? Why can't we be honest in church? Is it because when we speak with raw honesty, others don't know how to cope with it? They don't know how to deal with an honest answer? Little wonder that many have a fear of being honest, of being real. But can I suggest that if we want real fellowship in maze, we need to be authentic and real with one another? And when we ask an open question like, how are you? Let's be prepared for an honest answer and be prepared to give an honest answer and take time to stop and listen and take hold of that person's stretcher and bring them to Jesus. The second thing that Slater says may stop people reaching out to others for help is a fear of rejection. When some people look at you or me, they may be thinking, do I risk myself by dropping my mask and sharing my struggles and weakness with him or her? Do I dare share my story of abuse? Could I possibly say to this brother or this sister that I'm struggling with issues of sexuality and pornography? Do I become less in your eyes if you don't see me as a man or woman of God? And so, rather than risk rejection, people refuse to open up. Well, I believe that we need a church fellowship in which we can keep confidences. We need to have people with whom we can share the deep things of life and know that it goes no further. And we need a fellowship that is unshockable and inclusive and welcoming so that when people do share their issues with us, they will not experience shock, distaste, and rejection. During our building scheme in Orangeville, we worshiped for two years in church house. And there we picked up all kinds of rather interesting people. Sometimes it was tourists on the way through, maybe not speaking much English, but we picked up a particular man who was a Roman Catholic man who uh, had a, a drink problem. Uh, and uh, we wondered how we might minister to him, and uh, we, we did our best with him, and actually he followed us up when we went back up to Orangeville, which was three miles from the center of town. He followed us up and came to worship. He came in one Sunday, and it was Communion Sunday. Uh, and he came in a little bit late, and he was staggering. He was obviously drunk. Uh, and he came in with a red rose. Uh, and he staggered up to the communion table, and he put the red rose in the communion table, and then he crossed himself. It was the first and only time that anybody ever crossed themselves in Orangefield Presbyterian Church. And I wondered, how would the congregation hope, uh, cope with him? He was adopted by two men in our church who visited him regularly, who helped him get dried out, who helped him cope with his addiction, but he di sadly died at quite a young age, in middle age, from alcohol poisoning. He felt at home and accepted in a church that was unshockable. Now, that's maybe a mild example, but I wonder whether a fear of rejection is an issue for some people, and we need to carry each other's burdens and support one another as Paul commanded. Slater then says there's another issue he thinks that many of us have, and it's the foolishness of pride. Uh, pride, when you think about, of it, is the big sin. It, it is the sin behind everything else. It's the sin through which the angel in heaven rebelled against God that we now call uh, the devil or Satan. It, it was pride 
that drove him to rebel, and there was war in heaven, and the devil and his angels were thrown out into the pit. And when you think of it, pride is at the very heart of sin and the essence of our rebellion against God. But here's the thing, as a Christian, having recognized that I need Jesus and I cannot be saved without Jesus and His salvation, it is still possible to be full of pride. We don't like letting on that we've got problems and difficulties. And one of the things that we need to understand is that sometimes Jesus came to people, in John 5 and 6, if you want to read it, uh, He came to a man who'd been unwell, and He said to him, do you want to get well? And which might seem a strange thing to say, say to a man who'd been lying by the, the pool of Bethesda and was hoping that somebody somewhere would bring him healing. But he, Jesus said, do you want to get well? And sometimes in our pride, we nearly rather carry on with being on a stretcher than having the opportunity to come off it. I, I don't know if that makes sense to you. But pride, says Proverbs 16 and 18, goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, and in our fellowship, we need to be real and authentic and to be humble enough to admit that we need help. Now, I don't know about you, but I guess I've been brought up in a kind of Protestant work ethic, and I find it much easier to give to others than to receive. And I'm used as a minister to going in and praying for people in their situations and, and praying for their problems and their joys and their uh, all kinds of things. But sometimes when somebody says, well, I'd like to pray for you, I'm a bit gobsmacked. And I sort of think, well, I, I don't need it, you know, I'm, you know, I'm fine. Uh, I, used to, I might have said that when I was younger as I got older. Uh, now I sort of go and visit people and say, would you please pray for me? Uh, and, uh, but pride can hold us back. And then I want to get very personal because Slater's fourth reason for people not opening up in fellowship is the guilt of faithlessness. Jesus once met a, a man whose son was possessed by an evil spirit, uh, and the disciples couldn't do anything, and, and, and he couldn't find a cure. And the Lord said to this man, everything is possible to the one who believes. And he says to Jesus, I do believe, help my unbelief. I'm so glad that that's there because that is so often my attitude of faith. I do believe, but help my unbelief. And this is where I want to get really personal. I hope you'll forgive me for that. But when I was 15, my father took ill with cirrhosis of the liver. In those days, there were no liver transplants or anything like that, and really, it was just down to tablets and diet, and it took four years for him to die. He died when I was 19, and he was 56 years of age. On the day of his funeral, Christian people say to us a couple of things. One is, and this was unbelievable, one is, because it was a cremation, they said there'd be no resurrection of the body because there's no body to resurrect. And then they wondered why my mother didn't speak to them for 12 years. And the other thing that was said was, if only you had had faith, your father would have been healed. And that said in front of a 19-year-old who had just lost his father and on the day of the funeral was devastating. I thought, Am I guilty of faithlessness? Did I not pray enough? Did I not pray for the right things? Was there sin in my life that blocked my relationship with God that meant that God wouldn't answer my prayers? Uh, and I felt that faithlessness was just awful. If I'd had more faith, my father might have lived. And one of the things I find in life that's really strange is that it is in the church that amongst Christian people some of the most hurtful things can be said. And I counted the testament to God's grace that I entered the ministry and didn't let that situation over my father's death put me off my faith or put me off the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it was a devastating thing. But I wonder how many of us wonder, have I been faithless in some way? And is that what's causing problems? 
And of course, I recognized fairly quickly that not only was what was being said to me desperately insensitive, it was also unbiblical and wrong. But sometimes we are worried that if we're faithless, it will show us up in a bad light. It will show us as people unworthy of other people's respect and trust in leadership. So we remain silent and guilty. But here's the thing. If you want real fellowship in the church, be honest. Say it like it is, and if it's how you feel, tell people, well, you know, at this time I have no real consciousness of God's presence. Would you pray for me? Or if they ask you, how are you? Don't say fine when you're not, but say, well, I'm not waving, I'm drowning. I'm drowning in guilt, I'm drowning in doubt and fear. Uh, whatever it might be, your stretcher, I'm drowning in a feeling of being rejected. Uh, and that is so important to acknowledge. But don't let the devil or insensitive, foolish, unbiblical Christians trick you into making you feel that you're worthless. You are a child of the King. You are uniquely made in God's image. You are loved unconditionally by God and special to Him no matter what. You are so loved that Jesus went to the cross for you. So, when it comes to the instruction in the Bible to carry each other's burdens, what about making it something practical? When people call out and say, I'm not waving, I'm drowning, why don't you save me? I know the stock answer might be, well, I can't save you, but Jesus can. And it's important to make that message. But what practical steps do we think we can take to put a, handle on the stre or a hand on the stretcher and carry one another's burdens. Well, let me give you some suggestions as we come to a close. When people say, I'm not waving, I'm drowning, pray for sensitivity and wisdom. Pray for sensitivity to be slow to speak. I have a terrible habit, and, and maybe you're a bit like me, when somebody starts sharing something, I'd say, oh, well, you know, I went through that when I was 19 or, or 25 or 40 or whatever it might be. Uh, uh, you know, let's learn to listen and be slow to speak. God gave us two ears and one mouth for a purpose, that we should be more prone to listen than to speak. So ask people about what's going on in their life. Encourage them to be real. Uh, and try to be a people who will encourage others. And you don't encourage people by making them feel guilty. You don't encourage people by slapping them down and saying something damaging or hurtful. Speak sensitively and speak positively. Learn to be an encourager. It's something you can learn to do. Now, some of us are glass half full people and some of us are glass half empty people. Uh, and uh, I think I might be somewhere in between. I'm not quite sure. I, I'm that bit in the middle, the meniscus around the, the liquid. But anyway, uh, if you're a glass half empty person, you would find it hard to give encouragement to others. So let's train ourselves to give encouragement. Why not pray every day as we get up, Lord, help me today to bring a word of encouragement and comfort to someone I meet. It could be your wife or your husband. It could be your child or your parent. You know, it might shock some of them. Uh, I, I met a man one time who said that his wife had uh, said to him one day, I, I feel I should encourage you more, and I just want to thank you for your integrity in the workplace and, and how you go about your work as a Christian. He said, I was gobsmacked. He said, my wife had never said anything like that to me in my life, and he, it, it so upset him he hardly got to work that morning. Uh, it gave him a big shock. You know, we can take people who live in our homes for granted we can take our best friends for granted. Why not think of something encouraging that you can say and something that you can bring to them that brings them hope? It may startle them at first, but it will bring benefits to you as well as to them. Ask God to show you how to be creative in bringing encouragement to others. And above all, remember this is biblical. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 11. Paul writes this, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Encourage one another and build each other up just as you're doing. Carry each other's burdens. So why not pray, Lord, is there someone I could contact today with a word from you? It might involve sending them a letter if you still do that sort of thing 
or a card, uh, or if you still use snail mail, uh, uh, something else. But it may mean sending a message by text or email or Facebook or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, something like just thinking and praying for you in that interview you have today, that exam you have, that appointment you have with the doctor today, uh, as you meet with so-and-so, just whatever it might be. Uh, and uh, a little encouraging word. Uh, my eldest granddaughter is 10 years old. Uh, she's in Glasgow, and uh, she's going to the likes of a scripture union camp this week. And uh, she said, Granddad, I've never been to a Christian camp before. Uh, and I said, well, it's great. You know, I told her about the camps I used to have. Uh, one of your folks in Carrick Finn, we used to go to Carrick Finn. I have to tell you, we had to go and dig the toilets. I had to dig a trench and you just put a, 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 a four-section wooden seat over the trench and then at the end of the camp you filled it in, hopefully. Uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, because she's going to this camp, my son and his wife made the big decision they'd get her a smartphone. She hasn't had a phone before, and she's discovered WhatsApp on it. And so she WhatsApped me yesterday, and she said, Granddad, I'm very nervous about going to my camp. So I sent her a wee picture and a wee encouraging message telling her about how we used to dig the toilets, and I said, at least you won't have to do that. Uh, and uh, I sent her just a little encouraging word. What a gift. I know there's so much to complain about in social media today, but what a gift to have Skype and all those other things that you can use to contact family and to message people with pictures and all the rest of it. Why not use what you have to bring encouragement to others? And ask the Lord above all to show whom you might bring to Jesus. I love that these four men brought their friend to Jesus. And you know, I, I do know that the church is an interesting thing. But I wonder how many of us dare to invite our friends to church. I wonder how many of us would dare to invite our friends to a Christian event uh, and to say, you know, we, we really think this would be great fun for you. Uh, I love that these four men brought their friend to Jesus. And maybe they were just looking for healing. Maybe they were as surprised as the Pharisees that the first word of Jesus was, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And maybe sometimes, and I think we need to be careful in this, let, let, let's not take this too extreme. Maybe sometimes our being on a stretcher is not the fault of what other people have done to us, but our own fault. Like that dear man I told you about who died of alcohol and poisoning. He knew that was his own fault. He knew that he had abused his body over the years, and he just couldn't help himself. But we believe he came to Jesus, and we believe that he's free from that now. But sometimes we're on a stretcher because sin has put us there, and we need that healing touch of Jesus. And even if it's not physical, it needs to be spiritual. Son or daughter, your sins are forgiven you. That's where Jesus deals with the main issue. The secondary issues, he says, I have a body on earth. You are my body. You are my feet and my hands. So I, if I went to school when I was younger with a toe, a foot, and a hand, uh, and passed a leg on the way, Jesus says, you are my feet, my hands, my voice, my body. That's how I care for the world. That's how I help you carry one another's burdens. And I hope and pray that you and I together will seek to have a fellowship here and in other places that I certainly am involved in that's real and authentic. Let, let's pray together. And as we pray, I just want to give you a moment of stillness and quiet to make a response. Uh, Lord, we have heard your word this morning. Uh, we have thought about it together. We have sung your praises and we have... Uh, understood that your word tells us carry each other's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. So if there's something you've been saying to us this morning, if God has been speaking to you, it might be that he's saying to you, learn to be real and authentic and tell others what's really going on, people that you can trust, that you can respect. It may be that for some of us, we need our sin problem dealt with. 
And only Jesus can do that, and he loves to do it. And it may be that we just need to hear God saying, how can I be an encourager to others to carry others' burdens? So whatever level God may have been speaking to you this morning, just take a moment of quiet and say to him, Lord, this is what I'm going to do as a result of what I've heard. And I don't know what that is, and only you and God will know what that is, but if you say, God, I'm going to do something, then determine to do it. Let's just take a moment of stillness to respond. Father God, we thank you for a great and wonderful salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, the only one who can save us from our sins and who can give us new and everlasting life. But you have placed us in the church which you have described as your body. And I pray that you would teach us and help us all to know how we can be your hands and feet and voice and love. Uh, to one another and to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.